Welcome to SARA. My name is Mike Downey. I'm the immediate past president of the U.S. SARA Council and a member of the St. SARA Club of Des Moines, Iowa. This session is intended particularly for members who are relatively new to SARA to bring them up to speed on what SARA is all about and how it works. You should have some printed materials that include the slides I'll be using and some documents I'll be referring to. And hopefully you're viewing this session with at least one officer from your club who can point out specifics on how your club operates compared to what's presented here. Here's an overview. Three areas will be covered. First, the big picture of SARA, sort of the above the club level view. We'll talk about SARA International, its structure, organization, and leadership. We'll talk briefly about the SARA Foundation. Then we'll drop down a level to the U.S. Council for SARA. Finally, we'll review the state of, of, of vocations in the United States. After the big picture, we'll review how clubs work. And finally, we'll discuss vocations activities that clubs can engage in. Let's start with Sarah's mission statement. It's simple and elegant. To foster and affirm vocations to the ordained priesthood and vowed religious life, and through this ministry to grow in our own Catholic faith. This simple paragraph actually sets forth three distinct missions. First, to foster new religious vocations. Second, to affirm and support existing religious vocations. And third, to do, in doing so, to grow in our own holiness. These are the touchstones of all that we do in Sarah, and it's important that our work support all three missions. The easiest and the most fun is the second mission, to affirm and support existing religious vocations. One of the privileges of being a Saren is that we have the chance to get to know the bishop, the priests, the sisters, and seminarians on a personal level that most Catholics will not experience. We do this through appreciation events, and these people are incredibly grateful for our support. The feedback is positive and immediate. Contrast that with the first mission, which is to foster new vocations. The masses we attend, the rosaries we pray, the hours spent in Eucharistic adoration. We may not see the fruits of these prayers for a year, a decade, or e even ever. So what has to sustain us is faith that our prayers are working. But we know they are working because Jesus told us, pray, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers to gather his harvest. We may not know how or when or even where, but by faith, we know our prayers will result in an increase in new vocations. Let that faith sustain you even when the positive feedback is not there. Let's talk about the history and role of Sarah. Sarah was started in 1935 by four lay Catholics in Seattle, Washington. In 1951, a very significant event occurred. Sarah, as a lay apostolate, was officially aggregated to the worldwide Catholic Church. It is the only lay apostolate officially recognized as part of the worldwide church by the Vatican. That means that we are part of and under the direction of the Vatican. At all times, a cardinal is assigned to Sarah for oversight and direction. That being said, it's important to know that Sarah does not have an exclusivity on vocations work. In fact, our role is to be leaders on the vocations efforts. We do that three ways, by our own efforts within our clubs, by encouraging and supporting vocations efforts by other Catholic lay organizations, such as parish vocations committees and the Knights of Columbus, who do terrific work for vocations. These folks are not competitors. They are our teammates, and we want to do everything possible to make their work successful. Finally, we lead by engaging all Catholics, even those who may never be Sarens, to pray for vocations. I want to say a little about the person for whom our organization is named. St. Unopero Serra was a Franciscan priest who lived in the 1700s. He's famous for his saying, always forward, never back, which has become the slogan of Serra. Here's a brief outline of his life. He was born in 1713 in Majorca, Spain, a small island off the Spanish coast. At age 16, he joined the Franciscan order. Then, at age 36, he volunteered to go to the New World as a missionary, working initially in the missions in Mexico. At age 56, he began establishing the missions in California, the work for which he is most famous. He died at age 70 in California. 
It is said that he traveled over, over 24,000 miles in his work as a missionary, mostly on foot or on the back of a mule. Father Sarah was canonized in September 2015. His feast day is celebrated on July 1st every year. That's a thumbnail sketch of his life, but there are thing, five things I want you to know about St. Sarah because you are a Sarah. First, he chose a life of humble service at great cost to himself. It's easy to miss the fact that for the first half of his life, Father Sarah was not a missionary at all. In fact, by age 35, he had become a renowned professor of philosophy and theology at the University of Lulian in Spain. I'm guessing that was a pretty cushy job, especially at that time. He really had it made. And yet, at age 35, he hears God's call to be a missionary to the new world and gives all this up. He goes from the easy life to a life full of hardship, danger, and uncertainty. Such was his commitment to do God's will. Second, he suffered constant physical pain during most of his life as a missionary, but he never let it stop him. After, the first, after first landing on the east coast of Mexico, he set off on foot to Mexico City. Along the way, he was bitten by either an insect or a serpent. His leg, be leg became terribly infected. It was swollen and covered with ulcers on the lower portion. This wound never healed. Twice it brought him close to death during his missionary work. It puts the 24,000 miles that he covered mostly on foot in a remarkable light. Yet he never let it become an excuse for not doing God's will. Saint Sarah believed in the power of persistent prayer. At age 56, he set off on the journey to establish the missions in California. But the expedition ran into serious problems when it failed to rendezvous with the supply ship. By the time they reached the first mission site at present day San Diego, they were almost out of food and supplies, and the soldiers were suffering from disease and pestilence. The Spanish commander made a decision to abandon the journey and turn back immediately. But Father Sarah got the commander to agree to wait nine days until the Feast of St. Joseph for the supply ship to arrive. The Franciscans began a novena of continuous prayer to St. Joseph. He was an incredible advocate for the indigenous people. My guess is that Father Sarah was not well liked by the Spanish authorities, the Spanish military, or the Spanish colonists. He constantly intervened between them and the native people to prevent their exploitation, and he usually won. Finally, I want you to know about the significance of the bell in Sarah. You can see the bells prominently displayed in our logo. Father Sarah used an ingenious method to call the native peoples to learn about Christ. You have to realize that sites for the California missions were created from scratch, and usually there were no native people there. One of the first things Father Sarah would do is have one of the monks hang a bell in a tree and begin ringing it continuously. The bell could be heard for miles and miles, and soon the natives would come out of curiosity to see what was causing the strange sound. When they did, the Franciscans would befriend them, give them food, treat any illnesses they could, then they would send them back to their families, friends, and villages to invite all to come back to the mission. It was an incredibly simple but effective way to call people to learn about Jesus Christ. Always know this about St. Sarah. We have an incredibly effective advocate in heaven for our vocations work. Let's talk about Sarah International. There are about 13,000 Sarans worldwide, operating through about 400 clubs in 46 countries. Sarah is organized primarily into 10 geographic councils, of which the U.S. Council is one. Sarah's current Episcopal advisor is Cardinal Tom Collins from Toronto, Canada. Sarah International has a board consisting of representatives from each council and officers of the organization. The current president of Sarah International is Moira McQueen from Canada, and the president-elect is Emmanuel Costa from Italy. Sarah International also has an executive director who reports to the board. That person is a young man named John Liston, himself a former seminarian. John is also executive director for the Sarah Foundation and the U.S. Council of Sarah. So he really wears three hats and reports to three boards. He has a staff of three full-timers in the Chicago office and one part-timer. 
John and his staff are the only persons who draw a salary for Sarah work. All the rest are volunteers. In terms of the value that Sarah International brings to clubs, it's important to note that our mission is to serve the worldwide Catholic Church, not just the church in the US. So Sarah International brings the Sarah model to areas of the world where no such vocation effort exists, adapting it as needed to the local culture. Sarah also brings all Sarans together once a year at an international convention. It is a wonderful way to share experiences, inspire each other, and increase our spirituality. Sarah International also ensures that the Sarah activities are coordinated with the worldwide priorities of the Vatican, again, reflecting our standing as an official lay apostolate of the worldwide Catholic Church. Let's look briefly at the Sarah Foundation. The foundation is the grant giving arm of Sarah, and while an independent entity, is managed through Sarah International. Its mission closely parallels that of Sarah itself. It exists to fund programs that foster new vocations, to fund formation programs for existing vocations, and to enhance recognition of Sarah worldwide. Here's an overview of what the foundation has accomplished. Over $3 million has been given out since 2005. As of year end 2023, the foundation had 2.8 million in assets invested, all according to the USCCB standards. And in 2023, the foundation received about $523,000 in donations and income to fund its grant giving. But 2023 was a little unusual. Over 165,000 was raised and donated to support U.S. Sarah's sponsorship of the National Eucharistic Congress. And in 2023, the foundation also received several large bequests from wills. Typically, the foundation receives between 150 to $200,000 in donations. Over the last four years, annual grants have ranged in amount from about 70 to $100,000 per year. You can get a flavor of the types of programs and the institutions receiving grants from the table on page 4A in your printed materials. The foundation does a lot of good work for vocations. Each year in November, you will receive a letter or an email requesting a donation to the foundation. In fact, I just got mine this week. I encourage you to consider some donation, no matter how small. This is an easy and convenient way to help fulfill our mission for vocations in the worldwide Catholic Church. Let's drop down one level from Sarah International to the U.S. Council for Sarah. I mentioned there are about 13,000 Sarans worldwide. About 60% of these, or about 8,000 Sarans, are in the U.S., which is no surprise since Sarah started in this country. There are about 200 clubs in the U.S. Sarah's U.S. Episcopal advisor is Bishop Tom Daly from Spokane, Washington. Sarah U.S. is organized into nine geographic regions depicted by the different colors on this map. Each region has a region director. Each region in turn is organized into districts or groups of clubs, usually in close proximity. There are a total of 44 districts in the U.S. Each district has a district governor. The district governor is the primary interface between individual clubs on the one hand and Sarah International and the U.S. Council on the other. The district governor's job is to advise, encourage, and inform clubs they serve about best practices and Sarah priorities. Like Sarah International, the U.S. Sarah Council has a board made up of the nine region directors and the council officers, including the president, treasurer, secretary, and the vice presidents of five standing committees. These standing committees, vocations, programs, membership, communications, and cultural outreach help inform and inspire club officers through training and preparation of materials that clubs can use. The value the U.S. Council brings to Sarah Clubs falls into four categories. First, it is the repository of the wisdom of Sarah. At present, this is shared primarily by the training for club officers held in monthly conference calls in the areas of vocations, programs, communications, membership, and cultural outreach. 
It is also a source of new ideas and problem solving for clubs. The U.S. Council holds what is called the Sarah Rally each year in January to train and inspire club presidents, district governors, region directors, and any other interested Sarans. The rally is filled with new ideas for clubs and great discussion concerning issues that all clubs face at one time. Also, the U.S. Council, in conjunction with Sarah International, publishes a great quarterly magazine called The Saren, a hard copy of which is mailed to all Saren households. Third, the U.S. Council communicates the vocations priorities of the U.S. bishops to local clubs. The U.S. bishops currently have three priorities for SARA clubs. First is to have SARA clubs support vocations awareness in parishes through the annual vocations awareness events. Priesthood Sunday, the National Vocation uh, um, Awareness Week, World Day for Consecrated Life, World Day of Prayer for Vocations, Sisters Week, and Brothers Day. Sarah U.S. has prepared extensive support materials and programs available on the sarahus.org website to help clubs do this. The second priority of the U.S. bishops is the Newman Ministry. This program was actually started by Sarah and is an effort to keep young Catholics connected to their faith when they go to college. It's important because so many young Catholics fall away from the church when they go to college. Yet studies show this is an age when many religious vocations are discerned. Saren support the Newman Ministry by gathering and providing names of graduating high school Catholics to the Newman database, which Newman then forwards to the Catholic Youth Ministries on the campuses they will attend so that incoming students can be contacted to get involved immediately with the Catholic Church on campus. Newman has over 5,000 colleges and universities, along with the specific Catholic Youth Ministries at each in its database. A third priority of the U.S. bishops is to have Sarah U.S. develop web resources, a sort of digital toolbox for diocesan vocation directors to use in their vocations work. The result has been the sarahspark.org website with over 30 ready-to-use programs that diocesan vocation directors can use in their work. It is constantly being updated and refined based on input from vocations directors. Almost a third of vocations directors are new in the U.S. each year, and there is no real training to be a vocations director. Through sarahspark.org, Sarah U.S. fills a critical role in making vocations directors effective. A final value to the local clubs is the professional support for all the volunteers. Included in this is the maintenance of the sarahus.org and, and the uh, sarahspark.org websites. Okay, I'll finish up the big picture with a review of the state of vocations in the U.S. The simple fact is that the shortage of diocesan priests in the U.S. remains a very real crisis and it will likely get worse. Clearly, there's a lot of good things that have been happening. New priest ordinations and the number of graduate level seminarians have been steady since the year 2000. But as the carrot table on page 5A in your printed material shows, these have not been enough to offset the loss of priests due to death and retirement. So the overall number of diocesan priests continues to decline. Add to this the fact that the number of Catholics in the U.S. has grown by 50% since 1965. And you can see the continuing nature of the priesthood crisis and why our Sarah work for vocations is so important. Another aspect of the diocesan priesthood shortage is the grave shortage of Hispanic priests. While over one-third of the U.S. Catholic population is Hispanic, only 5% of the priests are Hispanic, Hispanic, and most of these were not born in this country. With the evolution of our church into a bicultural institution, we desperately need American-born Hispanic priests that can serve both cultures well. There are some Facts I think you should know about vocations to be an effective Saren. These are mostly from a book by Father Brett Brannon called A Priest in the Family. First, and most important, the Holy Spirit calls the vocation, not us. So creating a culture of vocations is critical to the call being heard, and this is what Sarens do. Priests have identified other priests as the key influencer in their decision to become a priest. 
So creating opportunities for young people to be around priests should be a focus of Sarah Clubs. The time of most serious consideration to become a priest is age 17. This is why the U.S. bishops are so keen about Sarah's support for the Newman ministry. Time spent in Eucharistic adoration was identified as an important factor in discerning a priesthood vocation. For that to happen, there have to be opportunities for Eucharistic adoration, which is something that Sarans can support. 60% of all priests were altar servers. This is why many clubs have altar server recognition and awards programs. On average, 50% of seminarians discern out. This is not a failure, but part of the discernment process that leads to a vocation calling being correctly understood. And those young men who do discern out often become incredibly strong Catholic lay leaders in our church. 92% of priests surveyed are happy being priests. While priesthood is much more than just a career, it is notable that no other career has such a high satisfaction level. Finally, it's important to realize that celibacy is not the cause of the priesthood shortage. We know this because mainline Protestant churches are experiencing the same shortage of ministers and they allow marriage. Too many Catholics naively think this is the silver bullet for solving the priesthood shortage. The only real silver bullet is prayer, creating a cultural vocations in a diocese. That's the big picture of Sarah and vocations. Let's look at how most clubs work. All clubs are chartered by Sarah International and have a unique club number. Clubs are organized by geographic areas within dioceses, but they are organized by diocese, not by parish, and they work with and for the bishop and the vocation director. They focus on prayer, service, and fellowship. The typical year for a club is July 1st to June 30th, as is true for Sarah US and Sarah International as well. Here's a final point. Vocations recruitment is not the primary function of a SARA club. While many individual SARANs do on occasion encourage young people one-on-one -on -one to consider a religious vocation, our primary function is to create a culture of vocations so that a religious call can be heard. Clubs are structured basically as you would expect. There is a board consisting of current and former club officers. In addition, there's a group of active officers. All clubs have a president and hopefully a president elect. There are usually several vice presidents as well. A vice president for vocations, for programs, for membership, for communications, and a relatively new vice president for cultural outreach. In addition, almost all clubs have a secretary and a treasurer. Many clubs have member trustees on their board. Clubs are also encouraged to have a club foundation representative to promote awareness of the Sarah Foundation. Not all clubs have all these officers, and in some clubs, the same person may hold more than one position, but this is the most common structure that clubs use. Let's look at club meetings. Club boards usually meet quarterly. The main meetings for all club members happen usually twice per month. The first is a more formal meeting in which there is a planned presentation, usually by a guest speaker. It is almost always focused on some facet of vocations. Usually these monthly program meetings occur on the third week of the month. A second and often less formal meeting for all club members happens after first Friday or first Saturday mass each month. There is an exchange of information about Sarah activities and vocations usually headed up by the president, but there's also time for chat and fellowship between club members after the mass. In addition, all club members are invited to participate in special appreciation events throughout the year. Often these take the place of the normal monthly program. There are six appreciation events that clubs might sponsor and hold an event connected with the annual ordination mass at the cathedral, a priest's appreciation event, a bishop's appreciation dinner, a sister's appreciation event, a lunch or dinner for seminarians, and an appreciation event for deacons. 
Not all clubs engage in all these events, but most clubs do at least some of them as a way to achieve the second prong of our mission, to affirm and support existing religious vocations. The third area we want to cover is vocations activities. I'm going to discuss these activities in two groups. First, the vocations activities strictly within the club that are pretty much just for club members. Second, activities outside the club that Sarah Clubs lead and organize to engage all Catholics in creating a culture of vocations as part of our leadership role. In terms of activities within the club, the two most prevalent are Eucharistic Adoration to pray for vocations and weekly or monthly rosaries. Adorations can be one hour liturgies or prayers stretched over a period of six to 24 hours with each hour covered by at least one Sarah Club member. Often these are organized in parishes covered by the club and happen during adorations already scheduled in those parishes. Weekly or monthly rosaries are often referred to as a 31 club. Usually a club member can sign up for a day of the week or a date each month to pray for vocations on an ongoing basis. Another program growing in popularity is the Adopt a Seminarian program. Club members sign up to spiritually adopt a seminarian and send letters of encouragement, pray specifically for their seminarian by name, send birthday, Christmas, and Easter cards. Some even invite the seminarians to a family dinner when the SEMs are home. You don't have to know these seminarians personally when you start. All seminarians are grateful to know that they are being specially mentioned in someone's prayers. And there are a great many stories of Sarans who have formed a special personal bond with a seminarian that has continued long after the seminarian becomes a priest. Some clubs get together as a club to put together care packages for all the seminarians in their diocese. These are often sent out in the fall or early spring. They can include simple items like postage stamps, microwave popcorn, gift cards, movie passes, phone books, or phone cards, books, and prayer cards, anything that seminarians might use during their time in the seminary. They are much appreciated as you can guess. And they let seminarians know that they are in your club's thoughts and prayers. Some clubs have annual altar server recognition and awards events, usually with pizza and pop. Again, we know that 60% of priests were altar servers, so we know this is a rich environment for future vocations. Sarah International holds a monthly conference call for an international rosary for vocations. At present, this is held on the last Saturday of each month at 8 a.m. Central Time. You should begin receiving a monthly email about how to participate. Finally, many clubs are actively involved in gathering information about graduating high school seniors to forward to the Newman Ministry, so these students can be contacted by the Catholic Youth Ministries on the campuses that they are attending. I've talked a lot about the Newman Ministry and how important the bishops think this is. I encourage you to review the information on this slide on your own. But mostly, I want to encourage you and your clubs <coughs> to engage in this activity, because if Sarans don't do it, it won't get done. There are three other special programs that many but not all clubs engage in. The first is to organize visits by three to five Sarans in the club to seminaries on a weekend. Almost all seminaries are open to this. Often you can stay right in the dorm with the seminarians and shadow them during the weekend. From personal experience, I think you will come away uplifted about the good hands that the future of our church is in. Many clubs hold an annual retreat focused not so much on vocations as on the holiness of club members. Often the club chaplain or the vocations director leads this, and it is often held during Advent or Lent. This is in fulfillment of our third mission to increase our holiness. A final special event is an annual mass to pray for deceased Sarans by name. That's been a review of vocations areas, activities within the club that pretty much just club members engage in. Let's turn to vocations activities to engage non-club members in creating a culture of vocations. These activities are generally organized, promoted, and led by the club 
and in some cases they parallel programs we have already discussed. Rosary programs in parishes, getting parishioners to sign up for a weekly or a monthly rosary for vocations, the 31 Club, just like what we do within the club, but for non-club Catholics in our parishes. Special adorations for vocations. When we decide to do a club adoration for vocations, we can extend its impact by inviting parishioners who are not members to join us through bulletin announcements in advance of the scheduled adoration. A program growing in popularity is the Call by Name program. The club works with a parish priest to invite parishioners at Mass one weekend to fill in anonymously a card with the name or names of young people from the parish they think the diocesan vocations director might want to speak with about a possible religious vocation. The cards are passed out in the pews. When they are uh, filled in, they are placed in a box in the back of the church. The Sarans supply the blank cards to the parish and follow up by collecting those filled in and forwarding to the vocations director. It's an easy way for all Catholics to become involved in vocations work, even if they feel uncomfortable themselves approaching young people about a vocation. Great results have been achieved where this program has been used. Starting and supporting parish vocations ministries is another great way to engage all Catholics in vocations work. This should include sharing all vocations program materials Sarah has compiled for the parish vocation ministries use, including especially the programs on the sarahspark.org website. Many clubs put together display boards with pictures and brief biographical information about the current seminarians in the diocese. These are distributed or rotated to parishes for display in the back of a church, along with individual cards for each seminarian, sort of like baseball cards that can be taken home to be placed on a refrigerator to remind folks to pray for a specific seminarian. Then there are the four national awareness events that the U.S. bishops have asked us to support in parishes. They are Priesthood Appreciation Sunday, which is the last Sunday of September, National Vocations Awareness Week, which is the first full week in November, World Day for Consecrated Life, which is the first weekend in February after Candlemas Day, World Day of Prayer for Vocations, which is always held on Good Shepherd Sunday, a couple of Sundays after Easter, there are two other relatively new events that can also be supported, National Sisters Week in the spring and Religious Brothers Day on May 1st. All of these are supported in parishes by Sarah Clubs using the many programs that are available on the sarahus.org website. Finally, many clubs sponsor and organize a traveling crucifix, traveling chalice, or traveling St. Sarah's statue among families or school classrooms for a week at a time. These sacramentals are accompanied by a seven-day prayer program with a focus on vocations. So there's a lot we can do to engage Catholics who are not Sarans in praying for vocations. We're just about done. I want to strongly encourage you as new Sarans to actively engage immediately in your club's vocation work. Here's how. Start with the basics. Attend the regular monthly program meetings, the first Friday or first Saturday mass and follow-up meetings and all appreciation events. But go beyond that. Sign up to pray a rosary once a week or a month for vocations. Dedicate one hour a month to Eucharistic adoration for vocations. Find out where these are scheduled to be held and help by covering an hour. <coughs> Adopt a seminarian. Again, you don't have to know the seminarian personally. That will happen as you find ways to encourage them in their vocations through letters, cards, or phone calls. There is no more intimate way to encourage a vocation at such a critical time in the discernment process. <clears throat> Help with the Newman Ministry information gathering. This usually takes place in May through August. Sign up to assist with an appreciation event. These take a lot of work, but they are effective and vital to affirming existing religious vocations. Join a Seven Sarans prayer team to pray for a specific vocations director. Last but not least, help recruit new members to Sarah, especially friends you know who have a special place in their hearts for vocations. 
We need more prayers for vocations. We need more hands for service, and we need more Sarans to demonstrate there is strong support from lay Catholics for priests and religious. Again, welcome to Sarah. I hope you have a much better understanding of what Sarah is all about and how Sarah works. Our work is incredibly important to the future of the Catholic Church, so engage in Sarah immediately. Take time to talk to your club officers about how to do this and ask any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time, and may God bless you and your work for Sarah and for religious vocations. That's it. Are there any questions or comments that anybody has? Remember, you have to unmute yourself. Just a tidbit on the uh, uh, recognizing the altar servers. Uh, we have been using the uh, challenge coins and the altar servers prayer cards. Uh, those are available in the Annie store if you are interested. Yeah, for whoever had that question about the altar servers thing, Maury just made the, the comment here that they join it with the uh, the new program called the Challenge Coin. I don't know if you've heard about that, but the Challenge Coin can be purchased at Viani Vocations, our, our Sarah store. And uh, there are coins that say on them, have you, have you ever considered being a priest? There's another one, have you ever considered being a sister? And we have it in English and Spanish. And what we do is we buy those and give those to priests or vocations directors. And in turn, they use those as kind of an icebreaker to go up and talk to a young person and say, I got something I want to give you. I just want you to think about this. Have you ever thought about being a priest or a sister? And it's uh, had great success where it's been used. So that and then uh, Maury also mentioned that there is an altar server prayer card. And again, that is also available from uh, the VianiVocations.com bookstore. If you go to the sarahus.org website, it will show up as the Sarah store. Just click on that and it'll get you right in there. Any other questions or comments? These are good, good points. Okay, doesn't seem like there's any, so I'm gonna call our meeting to an end and stop the recording here.